Um, I'm Kevin Wasserstein with Verson Ventures, a healthcare-focused venture firm out in California. And, um, I have the pleasure of being able to facilitate the discussion. Hopefully, this will be a dialogue with all of you, um, as um, we like to do here, especially on the last panel of the day. And with that, why don't I let um, Mark Leahy um, introduce himself, and then Steve, um, yourself as well. Again, Mark Leahy, uh, CEO of the Medical Device Manufacturers Association. We're based in DC, representing over 250 primarily small to mid-sized medical technology companies, uh, and uh, act as their eyes and ears in Washington, focus on advocacy and education. And I think, you know, one of the things that was telling from the conversations of the last day and a half, I think, uh, and something that Casey McGlynn, who we work with out on the West Coast, I think uh, identified a few years back. It used to be that I think folks in Minneapolis or in California always, and the entrepreneurs, viewed themselves as, you know, we just focus on making the better mousetrap, uh, everything else will work itself out. And now I think there's an acknowledgement that being 3,000 or 1,500 miles away from Washington can sometimes be the biggest hindrance to getting that product on the market because you're not as close to what's going on. So I think, you know, in MD May and AdMed, we try to help uh, companies fulfill that role. So uh, happy to be here. Great. I'm Steve Ubel. I'm president and CEO of Advamed. More importantly, I'm a Minnesotan, which uh, most people here by now know. My, I brought my six-year-old son with me on this trip, who's been lobbying to see the new Twin Stadium, which I'm going to take him to on Saturday. He's already lobbying for a Joe Maurer uh, jersey, so I don't know. I guess the apple doesn't fa fall too far from the tree, but he's uh, lobbying intently. But I, you know, I would agree with Mark that in my experience around the industry in the last you know, 10 years or so, I think it's fair to say that with the, you know, the macroeconomic environment, the environment at the FDA, healthcare reform, national competitiveness, there's really never been a time where, you know, public policy is probably more important or determining factor in the success of a medical device company. Um, so we've got challenges really across the board, and I think it's really a, a key time for the industry to, to pragmatically work through those challenges. And, at AdvaMed, we pride ourselves on uh, really a broad-based expertise in, in trying to do just that. The, the spirit of this dialogue is that um, a lot of us who are working on our companies on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it be here or in California or elsewhere, are not um, very facile in what goes on in Washington. So as we talk through this dialogue, it would be helpful, I think, for everyone here to understand what you're doing and what your objectives are and what your expected outcomes are. And, um, especially as we get into topics that I think have already been touched on. I think that's a very unique perspective here today. So um, with that, I'm going to search first for any hands that go up. And I have plenty of questions, but I'd like to see if anybody's got a burning one. No, so the question was, um, Congressman Paulson was at the FDA town hall meeting a couple of days ago. Uh, Senators Franken and Klobuchar were not. Can you speak to their role in promoting uh, innovation, medical technology, particularly in, in the state of Minnesota? Um, yeah, I had the opportunity to be at that meeting a couple of days ago. Uh, I wouldn't read too much into their physical presence. I think um, there's a lot, particularly in the Senate right now, the voting schedules can be a little bit different. Um, I know that, uh, in fact, I spoke with uh, Senator Klobuchar's staff yesterday, and she's going to be, we have our annual meeting next week in D.C., and she'll be providing a luncheon address. Uh, and at the meeting, she announced that she'll be holding a hearing. Uh, you know, she doesn't sit on the Senate Health Committee, which has jurisdiction, direct jurisdiction over FDA, uh, but she does chair the Innovation Subcommittee on the Senate Commerce Committee and acknowledge that she'll be holding a hearing either in June or July to look at issues impacting medical technology innovation, including what's going on at the FDA. I think that's kind of a way to, to you know, a jurisdictional hook. So I think, you know, that certainly demonstrates, uh, I think, her commitment and, and level of interest and, and appreciation, quite frankly, that, um, Perhaps uh, the current experiences that companies are having with FDA are not optimal, uh, and there are ways to kind of work together uh, collaboratively with industry, with Congress, and with FDA to make improvements. Uh, and I would suspect, you know, Senator Frederick being the junior senator from, from Minnesota, usually they, you know, if, if Senator Klobuchar has taken the lead on this, I'm sure that they'll be working closer together. And Senator Franken's on the HELP Committee. I, you know, I would agree with everything that Mark has said. I, I, I've been terribly impressed with Amy Klobuchar. She's a very savvy senator who's very well regarded by her peers, uh, Senator Franken, uh, as Mark mentioned, more junior member, uh, but also I think has really uh, gotten into the substance of medical technology. And uh, as I said, has a key role on the HELP Committee, which will consider a lot of these FDA-related questions. So, you know, I think, you know, Kevin, you asked the question, what should people be doing? You know, how do we approach our work? You know, it's, it's never been more important for you to 
have that interaction with your elected representatives. Because at the end of the day, you know, the pressure points for all the issues that we're working on, whether it's the FDA or healthcare reform or what have you, is impacting you know, your operation here in Minnesota, your jobs, whether you can get your technology through the process. So it's really important for you to you know, continue to engage in the Minnesota delegation. And I think the fact that you had so many, the, the you know, Congressman Paulson and the staffs there, though, is credit to the, the you know, LSA and the others uh, here who have worked hard in, on this issue in, in, in getting the visibility and also the attendance. The fact that there are over 500 in that room, I Absolutely. think, sends a message to uh, both FDA and, and you know, folks around the country that this is a, a top tier issue. So why don't we um, uh, start at the highest of levels and, and get your assessment of what the new leadership at the FDA means for us down the road, what your opinions are of the leadership, um, Hamburg, Sharfstein, and, and Shuren. And um, you know, give a sense of whether you think that's going to lead us down a path where we're going to see more transparency and collaboration, some of the things that we're shooting for. You know, I should start out by saying they're, they're all very impressive uh, individuals, uh, very distinguished backgrounds. And um, I think appreciate you know, the balance that needs to be struck in terms of the dual mission of the FDA, protecting the public health, but also promoting uh, access uh, to products and facilitating innovation in that, in that sense. Um, but I think they inherited um, you know, some challenges. Uh, there were you know, justified or not criticisms of the agency from a variety of stakeholders. Uh, we had... Um, you know, former FDA Commissioner Kessler, you know, speak to our board, I don't know, a couple of months ago. I know that he spends uh, time with the uh, current administration. And he uh, is basically of the view that all of those outside, uh, you know, impetus and inputs have had an impact and that, um, you know, the agency really needs to respond to those uh, challenges. So, you know, I think we're seeing on the part of the commissioner a greater emphasis on enforcement. I think Dr. Sharfstein has focused uh, on the transparency initiative. Uh, Dr. Shuren is somebody that we've known you know, for some time, having negotiated user fee, the previous medical device user fee agreement in a different capacity. So uh, you know, I think it's important not to you know, personalize you know, what's happening here at the FDA. I think those three individuals bring tremendous background. I think the right perspective and an appreciation for for balance. Having said that, you know, there's a number of concerns that we have, at least anecdotally, about what's happening at the, at the ground level. And I know we'll have an opportunity to get into some of those concerns. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I would echo that. I think, you know, they've been all extraordinarily gracious with their time and willingness to interact with industry. Um, and I think we're all focused on trying to serve that, that dual mission. I think the other element that's in place here is well beyond their, I think, their, their experience and background. But you know, they are operating in a political environment in Washington. And I think when you have members of Congress who uh, are leaning or, or making statements about, you know, the, the process being broken, obviously that turns up the heat on um, agency officials as well. And I think that can sometimes be um, less than constructive because it, it, it forces them to perhaps react in a way and address, you know, the reality is if, if a member of Congress uh, uh, starts kind of rattling the cage that that has a, an impact on how uh, things move forward. So I think that dynamic is one that that's uh, a, a, a sense of friction, and, and hopefully we can move away from that and allow both the, you know the management and the, and the reviewers to uh, focus on the uh, the task at hand. Mm -hmm. So uh, the shift at FDA um, has been talked about a lot, and the perception that it's a, they've shifted to protectionism at the cost of promoting innovation. Mark, why don't you talk to that and, and talk about what that impact will be in terms of how it's going to roll out into sure. proposed changes at FDA. You know, it, it's, and again, I think it depends on the product category. Um, I, I certainly don't think this is a new phenomenon that happened, you know, six months ago or a year ago. Um, you know, there are companies who had difficulties interacting with FDA in 2006, 2007, but I think if I were to kind of pinpoint a, a period of time where at least based on the experiences of our hundreds of companies that we interact with, I'd actually point back to, you know, September of 2008. And that's when you had um, those disgruntled FDA reviewers sent, write a letter to the Hill and to uh, uh, others talking about how, you know, the, they were making claims about management 
siding with industry and and you know again these are nine individuals out of an organization of 1200 so I certainly don't think they represented the majority um, but there was an audience up on the hill and and unfortunately I think that had created a dynamic in which um, this is my perspective I, I think managers were in a very difficult spot from that point moving forward to manage the process you know you always had turnover of the re reviewers and maybe the move to white oak accelerated that so you had a, a greater influx of new reviewers but you had, always had reviewers who asked what i characterize as the nice to know questions versus the need to know and managers would intervene and say you know those two questions aren't necessary but these three are, are worthwhile so let's move and would move the process forward i think once those whistleblowers started to get an, an audience um, it became very difficult for the managers to manage. And I think that all of the things, you know, moving goalposts, um, you know, lack of reasonableness, some have said, uh, changing requirements, I think this all gets back to, and, and unfortunately, I think this dynamic has created a situation where, you know, FDA really only moves as fast as its most conservative reviewer, because one person right now, given the dynamic, can really put the brakes on something. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's what we have to. Uh, fix and of course that's there's no silver bullet there, but I think that's that's the key issue that I think touches on 510k PMA IDE approvals. The general sense is if you look at the publicly available data, the agency is still meeting its 510k goals. Now, whether that the last three months kind of catch up to a new reality, the fact is that they are meeting their their Medufma obligations in the 510k process. They're missing their goals on the PMA side, which is uh, concerning. And I think we'll be engaging very closely with the agency and Dr. Schur, and I, I know this is on his radar screen, to identify the, the reasons. Uh, you know, those are the most important technologies. They're the technologies that uh, physicians and, and patients are waiting for. And um, you know, we need to identify the root causes of why they're not meeting their, their uh, review uh, obligations. Having said that, uh, the 510K process is uh, under an internal review at the agency. We're expecting that they'll uh, surface you know, public recommendations uh, sometime in mid-June, maybe the end of June, and uh, those recommendations would then be implemented uh, sometime in the fall, September, October uh, timeframe. And uh, as everyone in this room knows, the 510K process is the main pathway to market, you know, 3,600 some odd products in a given year. And uh, again, anecdotally, lots of concern on the part of companies and, and venture investors and a lot of people I'm sure in this room about you know, what they're seeing on the ground at the FDA. Um, but I think we have to be you know, pragmatic about it, identify you know, the issues where they are and try to address them. And my own sense is that um, you know, in my discussions with the commissioner and with Dr. Shuren, again, they understand that it's the main pathway to market for the vast majority of medical technologies. I don't believe they intend to get rid of the program. Uh, I don't believe they intend to radically change the program. Um, I do believe they'll make some suggestions uh, for changes as we have. I mean, no process is perfect. And um, you know, my hope is that we'll be able to make some targeted changes that are a win-win for, for industry and the agency. I mean, let's face it, companies want more clarity too. So if there are areas of concern that the FDA has, uh, for example, with a particular class of products, um, you know, let's have a conversation about that. What are the additional requirements that would be uh, reasonable to address the questions that, that need to be answered while still you know, providing access? Yeah. You both talked about them missing their numbers, and it may be helpful to people in this room for you to give a little bit more uh, color on what that's looking like, especially on the PMIA side. Where are they missing? How badly? Do you, do you have any of those numbers that you could cite? <laughs> not to put you on the spot, this was not one I, of the this I'll, discussion uh, topics. I'll try to tee it up. I, the, the goal itself on the PMA side is that 90, I believe it's 90% of PMAs have to have a final decision within 295 FDA days. Now, as Dr. Schultz can, can, can attest to, an FDA day is Kind of a moving target. I mean, it's uh, uh, 100 FDA days could be 300 Kevin Wasserstein days. You know, it, uh, it, it's hard to pin down. Uh, but that number uh, is being missed. Um, uh, I think they're about 50. They're supposed to review 50% of, of PMAs within 180 100 days. days, 180 FDA days. Again, that's difficult because I think more of the PMAs are going to panel. If you have a panel as part of your process, you know, hitting that 180 day 
uh, numbers is difficult. So, you know, they are, I don't know what the average time for a, for a PMA review is. Um, uh, they're not reviewing 90 within 100, uh, pardon me, 295 days. On the 510K side, they're supposed to review, uh, I believe it's 90% of 510Ks within 90 FDA days and 98% within 150 days, I believe, FDA days. Uh, they are meeting those goals, um, but again, uh, yeah. an SE, NSC would satisfy that goal as well. Satisfy it. Yeah. And there's no, no, another issue that's popped up, there are no performance goals associated with de novos. And you know, as we're seeing um, uh, perhaps FDA be a little bit more rigid about what products are going through 510K and, and the de novo being used a little bit more frequently, I think that's an issue that we'll probably have to work on during the reauthorization as well. I have nothing really to add to that other than to say, in working with Don, you know, I think in, in terms of all of these issues, it's going to be very important to have a credible conversation with the agency that we uh, take a quantitative approach. So, you know, a lot of the, the uh, chronic issues that, you know, are raised about whether it's reviewer questions or changing the milestones or moving the goalposts or what have you, you know, it's going to be very important for us to identify these issues in a way that we can demonstrate with data. So I encourage you to the degree you are having an issue, you know, let's have an organized way of collecting that information. We're doing it at, at the AdvanMed level. We'd love to work with you to make sure that we, you know, continue to collect that data so we can have a rational conversation with the agency. Why don't you talk about the number one, maybe two takeaways of things you're most concerned about and things you're focused on as a result of healthcare reform and how it'll affect the industry. Sure. I think the, um, well, first of all, there, there are a lot of opportunities within the health care bill, and it, it was politicized for obvious reasons, but if you really step back from it in the wake of it, its passage, you know, the good, bad, and the ugly is not a bad way to frame it. If you look at the, uh, you know, the good, I think there are, you know, obviously going to be new customers. There's going to be 32 million Americans that didn't have insurance previously. Now, the downside of that is with regard to medical technology, we know that they, you know, the the newly insured will not be as inten intensive medical technology uh, users than the uh, you know currently insured population for two reasons. One, you know most medical technology companies payment skews to Medicare and they're obviously already covered, and the newly insured tend to be younger than the currently insured under 65 population. So uh, that's part of why the tax became such a problematic issue is that in the analysis that we did, there was not an upside uh, associated with the coverage expansion to the degree there might have been with, for example, the payer community or um, you know, pharmaceutical companies for that matter. Um, so I would obviously put the tax in the bad category, but back to the new, you know, the, the sort of the opportunity side, new customers at some level, and, and some of this modeling is difficult. I mean, how many 55-year-olds with stable angina you know, out there who are not engaging the healthcare system that may benefit from for medical technology, some of this is very hard you know, to model out. There are important provisions with regard to prevention that I think will be opportunities around you know, imaging studies, uh, uh, screenings, preventive screenings, where you're waiving copays and deductibles. Um, you look at some of the healthcare acquired infection provisions, which I think will provide opportunities for companies. So I mean, I think there are some, some really uh, positive developments within the bill. The bad, the tax, obviously concerning uh, cuts to our you know, primary customers. I mean, I think the biggest takeaway that, you could, that should concern people is that we've added a fairly significant new entitlement in a very difficult fiscal environment already. So the bottom line is we're going to see sustained uh, pressure you know, from a fiscal perspective because of this bill and because of the deficit going forward. So I'd say the tax, the overall fiscal environment, uh, you know, there's a new panel called IPAB which is an independent entity that can make recommendations for future cuts that will uh, immediately go into effect unless Congress acts on a uh, supermajority basis to dis disapprove them. Uh, you know, I would also throw that into the mix as something that we're concerned about. Yeah, yeah, I, I just echo what Steve said. I think the two biggest threats out there, uh, one's the device tax. You know, obviously, 2.3% uh, whack on your top line, irrespective of whether you generated profits is, is something that's gonna be devastating, particularly the majority of of industry out there that are smaller companies that are perhaps going to owe more in taxes to the federal government than they generated in uh, in revenues, and so that's obviously something that um, you know 
in a perfect world, this, this tax would be repealed before it starts in 2013. You know, Congressman Paulson, obviously, from Minnesota, has introduced legislation. We support that. Um, whether or not it's realistic of enactment and passage prior to 2013, uncertain. Votes certainly aren't there right now. But at a minimum, um, you know, having some sort of small uh, company relief, I think, is going to be vital before the, the tax goes live in 2013. You know, small drug companies, small biotech companies have that relief. And so that's certainly a top priority for us moving forward. Uh, and then as Steve mentioned, the IPAB, this uh, independent commission. Um, you know, for political reasons there, they insulated the hospitals from these cuts for the first 10 years to basically get the, the hospitals on board for the votes. And from a medical device company, that's great because a lot of the reimbursement obviously tracks through the hospitals. I think one of the concerns that I have, and I'm sure others as well, is you know, when you're looking at the budgetary situation, as Steve said, this new entitlement is going to be over budget uh, likely. And this bipartisan deficit committee, that the commission that they've that, that they've created, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the recommendations here was to say, you know what, this iPad, there shouldn't be any exemptions. Everything should be considered on the table. And so, if they take away that that 10-year kind of reprieve from from hospital cuts, um, obviously that would be pretty significant for the device industry and something that we would be very concerned about. So I think those are the the two most significant threats. I think you, you, you both touched on the device tax. It sounds like um, there's activity to try to repeal that tax. Are we optimistic about that or pessimistic? Uh, uh, is, I think is Mark the ship said sailed it. I mean, in the short term, you know, the answer is no. I mean, uh, you know, unless, uh, you know, there's a new administration and a substantial change in the control of Congress, I don't believe the tax will be repealed. I do believe there are opportunities and, and uh, you should, you know, gain confidence from the fact that Mark and I work pretty closely together on the small company um, relief provision and identifying a common policy and working, uh, you know, hand in hand to try to get it done. It's one of my greatest disappointments that uh, it was not included. I could tell you a few anecdotes about, you know, what the, um, you know, the, the uh, leadership uh, in response to concern over small companies, you know, one member of the leadership, maybe she'll, she'll remain nameless, said, well, you know, I've got a friend and the Bay Area, who's a venture capitalist, and he just bought a yacht. So small companies don't need relief from this tax. And um, you know, I'm here to tell you that legislation gets made based on those anecdotes. And uh, for all the pushback, you know, you can obviously say, yeah, but that venture capitalist can make money doing, you know, investing in lots of other sectors, you know, particularly sectors that are not challenged by a tax or by an opaque or, or, or a challenged regulatory environment uh, or a new healthcare reform bill. Yeah. So I think that uh, it's something that we need to continue to work on to really, uh, and I think there might be opportunities between now and then to get more small company relief, uh, both at Just the federal some level. Just small company relief. I mean, yeah, there's, and, there's nothing and at in the there. state and at the state level. Uh, you know, we were. I was in Massachusetts a, a, a week or two ago, and, and Governor Patrick is exploring uh, with the Device Association there. I'm sure you've had conversations along this line too, Don. That you know maybe there's a state-based tax credit that can offset some of the tax uh, for smaller companies. Mm. You know, I felt like saying, well, where were you when it was first proposed? Uh, but I'll take it in terms of interest in uh, mitigating some of its worst effects. Well, we heard from a large, you know, large company lobbyists and they don't want a small business relief. And so that's, I know, you know, to credit to Abmed, I think they probably had some, you know, uh, uh, they came out on the right side. And I think it's, you know, making sure we work together to uh, convince those large companies who may be out there saying, you know what, treat the small companies the same way, that that's a very short-sighted, uh, perspective in that if they want their pipeline to continue to, to be filled with innovative technologies, they need to uh, have a great appreciation for some of the challenges, particularly in this economic environment of, of affording companies a little bit of runway uh, before they have to pay, you know, multi-million dollar tax. Mm -hmm. It's a what, tough issue. Let me just jump yeah. in there and say, you know, Mark is absolutely right, but you have to consider the context of uh, the tax uh, being applied to, to all companies and the fact the rate was already high. So, I mean, it, you know, for large, medium, and small companies, the tax is a bad thing. And uh, nobody wants to see uh, the tax uh, at all. So, I mean, it's, it was a difficult situation, I think, for, for all companies in the space. And in fact, I think we had about 10 Democratic senators who uh, proposed an amendment. It would uh, basically exempt the first 100 million in U.S. sales uh, from any tax, and then U.S. sales from 100 to 150 million. Uh, would be uh, taxed at half the rate. I think, again, looking at the models from some of the investment bankers and VCs, you know, it really was given the regulatory costs of getting through the FDA and reimbursement, it, you know, companies are, and VCs are saying, you know, 
companies really need to, it's, it's once they hit that $100 million in annual revenues that they're really generating that first dollar profit. So I think that was kind of how the, those numbers uh, came about. And, and also being sensitive that there wasn't, you know, would we would like to see a, a greater carve out, sure, but we also have to be sensitive to the politics and not making it so significant that the, the, uh, the shift on the larger companies would, um, you know, have them step away. So mm -hmm. I think it was a delicate balance and I'm, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll be able to see it, see it through. Yeah. Topic we haven't heard as much about today. I haven't been in all the sessions, but I haven't heard much about it. Comparative effectiveness. Hmm. Um, I'm surprised it hasn't come up more. I'm curious to hear your views on what the rollout of comparative effectiveness is going to look like and the implementation and how it's going to affect the industry and how you guys are thinking about comparative effectiveness as a, um, a mode for us going forward. So, sure, I'll, I'll see that one at okay. first, perhaps. Um, Obviously, this started well before healthcare reform uh, with the stimulus back uh, almost a year and a half ago now with the $1.1 billion allocated. And I think, you know, one of the uh, positives in this whole comparative effectiveness debate, when it started off, it was really singularly focused on technology assessment. Let's compare this drug to this device or these two devices. And it was, you know, I think from our perspective, frustrating that, you know, it, it, you look at the $2.4 trillion spend in healthcare. Devices are less than 5% of that. Pharmaceuticals are less than you know, 12%. And yet that was where all the energy around comparative effectiveness was, was focused. And you know, I know that AvMed, MDMA, and others were, were very active. And you know, I spoke before the Federal Coordinating Council and AHRQ and saying, you know what, before you allocate these dollars and look at your priorities, let's realize that technology assessment is kind of at the, the tail end of, of the healthcare delivery system. And if you were looking at what's really driving costs and the $2.4 trillion spend, it's the 60 to 65 percent of, of dollars that are spent on chronic disease management, of which 70 percent are totally preventable through behavioral changes, exercise, smoking cessation. And then the other primary driver here is the inefficient delivery system. I mean, we look at a hospital spend, 65 percent of a hospital spend is on the salary, overhead, and benefits of the staff. About 4 to 8 percent is on, on medical technology. And so we, you know, we use it as an opportunity to say, fine, if you want to use some of those dollars to try to do head-to-head -head comparisons on technology, that's fine. But the real opportunity here is to look further downstream. How do you make the delivery systems more efficient? You know, they've looked at integrated systems and really compare and contrast different systems based on that data, see which ones can be applied more broadly, and then either further downstream, look at, you know, prevention and wellness programs. Safeway and others have got a lot of press about how they've incentivized employees to reduce their healthcare costs. And so, we were at least pleased, um, you know, when they came out with their, their 100 recommendations, it seems like they, they took the advice of various groups and, you know, about a third of the recommendations are on technology assessment, a third were on delivery system reforms, and a third were on prevention and wellness. And so I think that's, you know, that, that's a good news story. I think, you know, where this goes now um, and through the healthcare bill, and I'll let Steve kind of get into maybe the discussion about the, the, the new private-public partnership, but the, um, you, know, you know, there's no direct link to cost or coverage, um, but I think it would be pretty naive to think that that's not a direction that, that this is going to go down. I think every venture capitalist, every CEO, was, we've heard that from all the panel, you know, you have to look at, make sure you have clinical data to demonstrate your, your value proposition. Um, because I, I, you know, from a political perspective, um, they didn't have, linking the, that data and comparative effectiveness directly to coverage right now was politically a very, you know, you don't want to have to fight a battle in politics if you don't, if you can kind of punt it down a few more years. And from their perspective, why fight that when there's no data to make a coverage decision on? So I can see a scenario, and this is something we're going to have to work as an industry together on as well, to push back, because there will be efforts over the coming years, once data is generated from some of these studies, to say, well, now that we have it, it would be irresponsible not to use it in coverage decisions or mm -hmm. link that to, to cost. And I'll just close by saying, um, I think that the, the, the tell was when you have Steve Furrow, who ran coverage at CMS, going over to ARC on detail to help design some of these studies, I think that demonstrates that this link to coverage is, is certainly something that we're going to have to watch closely and, and, and try to push back on. Hmm. You know, this new entity, which is a federally funded entity, it's, it's a private not-for-profit, um, it will have a surcharge assessed on payers that will help fund it. And now they're in the process of putting the governance together and the board, which will have, uh, you know, thanks to our collective efforts, uh, representatives from the medical device, pharmaceutical, and diagnostics industry. There will also be industry representation on the advisory uh, committee uh, process. And I think there are some good opportunities 
built into the process for companies to engage with the new entity at the front end when they're identifying their, uh, their research priorities. And then if they determine that they're going to study your technology, the opportunity to, to you know, get into a conversation around scoping and what the comparator technologies are and so forth. And then again, before any recommendation is uh, finalized, you know, companies and other stakeholders will have the opportunity to engage uh, the new entity. But it's clear that comparative effectiveness is, is uh, going to be with us. It's not a new development. Um, I do think Mark is right that you're going to see uh, very tight coordination. So the CMS coverage area is going to identify data needs or data gaps, and they will turn to the new federal entity and communicate those uh, needs, and those entities will do the studies. I mean, they'll mm -hmm. option the studies out to ARC and NIH. Um, I do think it's good that the entity uh, will focus on clinical comparative effectiveness, and there are some uh, pretty strong uh, walls around you know, clinical versus cost. I, I tend to agree with Mark that we'll still see some cost studies. The stimulus money doesn't have that um, impediment. And there are other entities that today are doing cost-based studies. But I also want to step back and say, I, I don't think this is just a, a, a net negative uh, for the industry. I was in uh, San Diego a few weeks back talking to a CEO in the, in the uh, sleep apnea space, in the CPAP space, who was saying, you know, I just have a, a hell of a time breaking down the, the uh, treatment silos uh, for the practitioners that could use my technology. And uh, you know, he was saying, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a person who has sleep apnea, but I don't know it, and I go to a doctor for depression, I'll get a drug. You know, if I go to a doctor because I have, um, you know, I've got uh, a cardiac arrhythmia, you know, I might get a catheter-based intervention, I might get something else. But nobody's stepping back and saying, is the underlying reason for these problems that I have sleep apnea? Now, if you have a major government entity doing a landmark study on various ways to treat sleep apnea and the downstream health you know, complications associated therein, that might enable a company to break down some of these uh, treatment barriers and help diffuse the technology. So you know, it's going to be with us. It's something we're going to need to be uh, vigilant about and shaping and making sure it's not used inappropriately. Uh, and particularly with medical devices that you don't assess a technology prematurely and stifle innovation in that, in that fashion. But I do think there are opportunities for companies who uh, will build this data early on in the, in the development process. And if you can prove and differentiate your technology, it can really help uh, you know, diffuse the technology. Just to follow up, because Steve made a really good point there. I think you know, in talking to our small company CEOs and the VCs, I think that the, the biggest fear with comparative effectiveness that this becomes yet another front-loaded requirement for coverage uh, for new technology. And I think, you know, if this is about waiting until technology is mature and then comparing and contrasting different uh, modes of treating patients, I think that's, that's an area that can really provide value and, and be worthwhile. If this pivots and becomes kind of a front-end requirement that unless and until you have that five-year data to get coverage, it's ball game over for any small company. That's going to be kind of first product out because you don't have the revenues generated on the other products to kind of subsidize that delay. And then the other key element, I know something that, that Steve and I have been working closely and that goes back to the, the gain sharing days as well. When they're measuring clinical effectiveness and quality, it's so important that they look at it over the proper time horizon. Because if you're looking at comparing two therapies over 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, often the value for some of these medical technologies won't be captured in that, that window. So you know, that's another key focus I know that we're working hard on to make sure that you know, setting these up, that they have the proper time horizons to capture value. Because you know, on the wrong circumstances, a drug could look much more cost effective than, than a device intervention. Mm -hmm. So why don't we step back? We've got you know, a captive audience here. Um, you're, your, your room full of constituencies here. So um, why don't you step back and let's talk about what this group can do to make a difference going forward. You know, we, we've heard about all the issues. We hear about a lot of solutions being mentioned. What can we in the room here do to affect the path going forward? Sure. Mark? Um, well, as Steve said at the outset, I think, you know, engaging, in the, you, you all have your businesses to run. We don't expect you to be experts on policy. Read every page of every bill. Um, but there's no doubt we've got some big issues out there that are going to have a profound impact on 
the uh, makeup of this industry moving forward. Uh, and I think one of the things, and I'll just, you know, FDA, that's, I think, probably the biggest issue facing this industry right now, and that issue is not going to go away for the next, you know, 18 months. And I think one of the challenges we have, and I'm sensitive to what, what companies and what investors are facing, is that you all have numerous examples of your interactions with FDA and perhaps, you know, the moving goalposts, it being unreasonable, but when you ask a company to say, okay, let's, you know, can we put those on paper in an objective fashion and provide that to FDA, they say, well, we, you know, we, the fear of retribution. Um, and I think, you know, it's very, and, and Jeff Sherman will point out, well, unless we have specific concrete examples uh, that illustrate the concerns you're raising, it's, you know, it's kind of he said, she said. Yeah. And so I think it's, you know, know through organizations like ourselves, there are ways in which you can provide that information. If it needs to be de-identified, we can do that. I mean, we've done this. We probably have 50 companies who respond in the last, you know, couple of weeks when we've been soliciting some input, varying levels of detail. Um, but that, those real life examples uh, help to uh, illustrate specific problems. And it's not just, you know, to run up to Capitol Hill with them. It's really to provide, first and foremost, the folks at FDA who are going through this process of evaluating how they can improve the 510K system. And then without those, those, I mean, so providing those examples, uh, and I don't think, you know, there's always that fear of retribution, but um, we're at a point, folks, where things can't get much worse. And I think uh, unless and until uh, there are those, uh, 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 and again, it can be de-identified, but we have to be able to go forward and say, FDA, here is what we're, we're seeing. You know, a couple of companies have gone out of business, unfortunately, you know, their stories are out there. Yeah. So that's the, that's the, the one uh, key issue I'd say is, you know, make sure your, your stories, you know, come forward with your stories, tell them to FDA, tell them to the Hill, because uh, without that, um, uh, I think it's, it, it's, we're gonna have a lack of data to, uh, to support the arguments we're trying to make in Washington. So just explain how they can do that. Yeah, I mean, because well, for people sitting in this room, we say talk to Right, well, Capital again, Hill, I mean, we, either organization, we've got, uh, you know, an FDA working group, we've got a 510K, you know, subcommittee where, you know, it's CEOs, it's regulatory folks, it's venture capitalists, and, you know, I think you, you know, you know how it works, we were basically, we make it very user friendly, so, you know, send us the stories, we'll have a staff person call up, you know, we've got questionnaires, get the specifics, put a timeline together, so, you know, we're, we're not asking you to, to, to spend your own time to generate this, it's simply, if, if you have a good story to tell, We've got a staff that can, you know, collect that information. I know Steve does as well, and, and that's the first part of the process. Then, for example, we've got our annual meeting next week. We've got Dr. Sharfstein, Dr. Sherman. We've got panel members, but as part of that meeting as well, we have congressional fly-ins where we get you up in front of your representatives, your members of Congress. Admin does a great job with this as well. It's having those interactions with policymakers. We've gone in to meet with Jeff Sherman multiple times in the past, you know, couple months. It, those are the types of things that um, it can be daunting to participate in Washington, but that's why we're organizations like Admin and MBMA are there to kind of help hold your hand throughout that process. Um, because if you don't engage, uh, you'll get run over. And uh, we've got a pretty big train coming at us, um, and we need to make sure we don't get run over. Yeah. Steve? There are plenty of ways to plug in. And that, you know, advocacy today is really not a spectator sport. So if you think your association is going to handle it, you know, I appreciate the confidence, but, you know, we need your active participation, we need you to come to Washington, we need you to come to meetings like Mark or ours to plug in and engage policymakers. You know, it's, it's just incredibly impactful to have a small group of companies come in and meet with a member of Congress who then is gonna in turn speak to, you know, the commissioner or to the device center head on the same issue. And he absolutely needs to hear from you what it's like on the ground, at the ground level in interacting you know, with the FDA and what sort of impact it's having, you know, at the, at the local level. So the other dimension here is jobs. And the reality is if there's anything that members of Congress are focused on today, it's the macroeconomic environment. So if you can translate what added costs mean for you or what, um, you know, uh, obviously uh, going out of business means for you, um, that will resonate. And uh, we have to just have your active participation, work with Don, help us build the quantitative case. And I think we also need to broaden the discussion. Uh, we're doing a, a, well, we're not, not we're, but PricewaterhouseCoopers actually, without any funding from Advomet, is doing a study to uh, look at uh, review times as well as 100 other uh, publicly available uh, data elements comparing the US to eight other countries. 
both mm. developed and developing uh, on, whether, uh, on how conducive they are to innovation. And uh, regulatory uh, approvals will be a part of that, but IP protection, venture investment, you know, a whole series of uh, elements will be a part of that because I think we do need to broaden the discussion. There are some warning signs here. I mean, we have a commanding lead in the life sciences, but venture investment is down. The number of clinical trials being held in the U.S. versus overseas has been uh, cut in half over the last five years. It's gone from 80-some percent uh, to 40-some percent. Uh, that tells me that, that uh, other countries are looking at ways to go up the food chain, if you will, in terms of recruiting companies. You know, it used to just be manufacturing. Now it's going to be R&D. Clinical trials is a precursor to that. Um, you, you look at our, our uh, exports. You know, over the last 10 years, our exports have been cut in half. You know, it's, it's, it used to be seven billion, it's now closer to three billion. So we're sort of on the bubble as one of the last light manufacturing industries with a net balance of payments. So again, it's not to say that the sky is falling. You know, I'm not given to hyperbole by, by personality, but the reality is if you look at a series of these data points, I think we need to broaden the discussion and say, you know, as a matter of industrial policy, what are all these policies doing to the innovation ecosystem. It's not just one thing. You know, the FDA will, will work through that. But you look at the macro environment and some of these other elements I've talked about, the FDA, healthcare reform, uh, a litigation risk, which we haven't gotten to in terms of the trial bar's number one priority in Washington, is to repeal the Supreme Court decision on preemption, you know, which says if you put your product through the most rigorous process at the FDA, you should be inoculated from certain state tort claims. So I think it's the cumulative effect of these policies that we really have to get policymakers' attention around uh, because it's not just one thing, it's all of them. What I'm hearing is, um, as takeaways for this group, is everyone's voice really matters right now. It's a really important time for the industry. And um, I've watched firsthand kind of the impact of one or two voices and the collective group. And I think this, what's going on in Minnesota in terms of the energy that people are putting behind this and you know, across the U.S. as well, you know, everyone should know in this room that every voice matters. The other thing I think I heard was that you guys are really starved for data to be able to make, um, you know, not just arguments and um, not get up there and whine, but to support it with fact-based arguments. And um, so if people in the audience have those, bring them forward to both, both organizations. And um, I, I assume you both will be available for a while so everyone can chat with you after Absolutely. this. Um, Mark and Steve, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for attending. Uh, we're, we're already working on next year's 10th uh, production of this uh, conference. Uh, we appreciate your participation and give us, give us comments, critique, et cetera, and let us know about, uh, uh, about the issues that you're having with uh, 510K kinds of things and, and other things. We, we, we really need the information. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, IBF. We really appreciate it. And thank you, sponsors. Amen. Okay.